recording now. And we're going to get and pick up where we left off on last week. There's one chapter in this book, this book right here, Creeping Compromise. Boy, it's taking a long time to get through, but I hope that you are appreciating the conversation. So it's Creeping Compromise, Chapter 5, Colorful Cos Cosmetics and Jewelry. And I don't even know what part we are. We're just going to go <laughs> from where we are. Uh, let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for our uh, reading focus. We understand that we use these readings as an opportunity to have good conversations as a family, to be on one accord, because we want to be light and salt. We want to be a good witness and pleasing in your sight. So help us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Uh, I want to uh, mention something. Uh, we do have every year, beginning of the year, we have the 24-hour the prayer, the all-day uh, uh, all prayer uh, as a conference. And, uh, and, you know, those flyers are out, but if you don't know how to get them, I'll be glad to share that with you. Uh, it's uh, this Sunday, January 22nd. Uh, they always give me a half an hour. And, and it's a good time. It's 3 p.m. in the afternoon on Sunday. So we were blessed. Pastor, yeah. I think you have the wrong time. Did you say January 22nd? No, January 2nd. Did I say oh, 22nd? Yes, yeah, okay. January 2nd. This, particular, this Sunday, January 2nd, we'll be on from 3 to 3.30 and every half an hour, a different church will be on, but that is Southeast time. We'll publish that again. Maybe we'll put that in the e-bulletin uh, and how to get to it so that um, so that if you want to listen in, uh, again, we've been doing it every year, but we're not sure if the word gets around. So what you hear at the beginning of prayer meeting uh, before we record on, on Wednesday nights, uh, we're going to Lord said, just do what you've been doing, you know, bring some of your folks on who lead out with a few scriptures, a thought, a prayer, and that half an hour will fly right by. It doesn't have to be pastor hood preaching. It could be the saints doing what they've always done. And I think that we have some great prayer warriors. So tune in for that this Friday night from five to six, we'll have our watch service. I know that's kind of early. But the idea is to safely get you on back home and uh, and whatever happens after that, you'll be looking out the window instead of trying to get through the traffic. You want to get you home safely, but it's going to be a beautiful communion service on um, on this Friday evening on New Year's Eve. And then, of course, the New Year's Day service is planned out and ready to go as well. It's going to be a nice service as well. But communion is taking place. Uh, on Friday evening at the five o'clock watch service. And so we look forward. If you are a deacon, the deaconess elder, you're expected to be there at four. So that's the, the uh, uh, four as uh, if you're ordained, I should say, because you're going to participate. If you're not ordained, it's a good way to get ordained. It's to be on time. <laughs> all right. So, Amen. <laughs> all right. So we, uh, you want to say something about that, Sister Watts, before I get started? Uh, yes, we just want to make sure all the deaconesses are there at, at least by 4.30, 4.30, so we can discuss procedure and any questions you may have. Asking all deaconesses to be there and in white, fully dressed at 4.30. Okay, so we we're going to have time and be seated all right so we're gonna have that's when we're gonna do our run through so really if you're there at 4 30 you're probably gonna be messed up <laughs> so we you know you you're supposed to be ready for the run through at 4 30 so i suggest you try to be there a little bit earlier if you can if you don't mind me stepping in and saying that uh, no so, i'll be there i'll man, be there oh, i know you will <laughs> <laughs> I know you will. I'm talking to everybody. I'll be else. there. I'll be there. <laughs> all right. All right. I heard a voice. I'll be there. there. I'll be there. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's get the creeping. There. There go. Okay. So we're going to play tonight. Everybody going to say, they're gonna, I'm going to be looking for you too. Everybody who said, I'll be there. I'm going to be looking. All right. Colorful cosmetics and jewelry, creeping compromise, chapter five. 
let's continue where we were. Okay, Elder Stone, you, you out there tonight? Yes, sir. Oh, do you mind reading a little while for me? No, no, mm -mm, fine. All right, thank We're you. We're on uh, chapter five, page 58. Over and over again, the Bible connects the wearing of colorful cosmetics and jewelry with sin, apostasy, and heathenism. When they turned away from the Lord, they put on the ornaments, which, as Isaiah said, declare their sin. There is no lack of texts which spell out the truth clearly and without equivocation. The great God of heaven was displeased with those things and used them to symbolize departure from his will. Turning to the New Testament, the picture comes into even sharper focus. John in the book of Revelation describes the scarlet woman of sin symbolizing the false church as decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Revelation chapter 17, verse four. In contrast, the true church is depicted in Revelation chapter 12, verse one, as a beautiful woman, clothed with the glory of the sun. This woman is called the bride of Christ in Revelation 21, verse nine. Notice that no ornaments, notice that no ornaments are worn by the bride of Christ. These types of the true and the false religious systems also point up the estimate God places upon the use of artificial adornment. Two final texts from the writings of Peter and Paul will reveal the firm, consistent views of the early church concerning this practice. Both of these stalwarts occupied positions of influence among the disciples and their spirit-filled letters represent the unchallenged view of the apostolic church. Paul wrote, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women possessing godliness or professing godliness, but with good works. First Timothy chapter two, verse nine and 10. Peter wrote in much the same manner, except that he especially addressed Christian women who had unbelieving husbands. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. First Peter chapter three, verses one through four. These words of Peter contain counsel for every Christian wife in the church today. And they deal with one of the most perplexing problems that faces Christian women whose husbands are not with them in the faith. How far should the believing wife go and trying to please her unregenerate husband. All right, all right. We're gonna pause right there. I don't want to throw too much at you all at once. Uh, any thoughts about what has just been read? For, for, for me, um, 
those texts that were brought up are things that were also taught as a part of being modest. And um, uh, we were taught that, no, it doesn't mean you can't wear your hair braided or no, it doesn't mean that you can't wear any jewelry. It's just supposed to be modest and you're supposed to have a meek and gentle spirit, not wild and loud and uh, looking like um, a clown. So <laughs> it's, it's, it could be taken, well, it's, it's taught both ways, I should say. What's the other the way? The other way. If it's uh, other than what you just said, what's the alternative? The, the scriptures that were added now or the, that that's being taught now, the way it's being taught now is that n you shouldn't have any of these uh, artificial adornments. Okay. Uh, so, um, well, let me just say this. The original audience already understood the Old Testament scriptures. So they may allude to sometimes quoting Old Testament scriptures, but uh, with the original audience, they didn't need to redo the Old Testament because it was already understood. There was no argument there. They just simply updated it to include uh, the things that they were dealing with at that time, such as these women coming out of pagan churches into the Christian church, because this is what's new. The, the Jews, Jewish women, um, uh, didn't really need to be told a lot of this, but the non-Jewish women coming into the Christian church needed to understand that the things of the world uh, that was acceptable before now is not acceptable now. So it was, was written is in, in from Paul and Peter is not to replace Old Testament text. It is to add to. You change your mind, uh, Sister Valerie? Yeah, I better not stir the pot right now. Thank you. <laughs> I will stir it later then. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if you don't want to stir it now. I just wanted to make sure that there was, uh, it was clear that there's consistency here. For instance, broided hair uh, is, again, we can't look at that through uh, a 21st century viewpoint. You look at it through a first century view, uh, which Roman uh, women with a Hellenistic, meaning Greek style, uh, put all that jewelry in their hair. They were braiding jewelry in their hair. So the issue was not braids, it was braiding the jewelry into their hair. And what is the issue with braiding jewelry in your hair? Another way of saying I'm a certain type of woman trying to get a certain type of attention. Elder Stone? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it is, I, I understand. I understand exactly what you're saying. And, and as Christian women, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how, however, in our culture, in this climate that we're in today, it has been such a, 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 a battle to be, have the freedom to wear your hair and braids in professional circles. In yeah. many cultures- Well, that's a different argument. There, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but but it still it, it still gets lumped in together because uh, other women from other cultures can wear blue hair, green hair, pink hair, mm -hmm. and and have it with with a cute little cut or or what it, what if they call it a cute cut, but they can wear green hair, they can wear all kinds of strange colored hair, but as soon as a black woman puts a braid in her hair, or she wears a dread it becomes an issue in some professional circles. And, and so when you come to church and then you're hearing, oh, no braids uh, or, or no, no, it didn't say, it said braided hair. Broided, as though broided, it was something, not braided, broided. 
Um, okay. Yeah, like it's embroidery. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. In we, some translations, we, we it is braided, and in some, it's braided. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, people well, just have a problem. Is important. Yeah, context yeah. is important. I was a, a um, supervisor, uh, a, a junior manager, if you want to call it that, at Key Tower years ago uh, on the 26th floor was Deloitte and Touche. And mm -hmm. um, they had 508 employees. And at any given time, no matter when you came, there were exactly eight black employees, mostly women. And so if a if they hired a black person, then all the black people wondered who was getting fired because there was exactly eight at oh, any boy. given time. And the reason being is that the government uh, said in order to stay in business, you must have a certain percentage of minorities, okay? So they had exactly eight. And so you can imagine the, the, uh, the stress it caused as the first black supervisor, I <laughs> guess people kept going to my right-hand man thinking he was in charge and he had to keep telling them, no, is that guy over there, right? And I'm just giving you the context. But um, the, in that, uh, kind of right here in Cleveland, uh, we didn't, and maybe it's just that company, nobody gave women a problem, Black women a problem with how they wore their hair. What they did have an issue with is being overdone with jewelry, right? And so this is a secular context. This is not a, it was considered not to be business attire, right? So, uh, and, and I'm sure that I'm not a woman, so I'm sure my experience is gonna be very limited, but in most outside of the military and pastoring, um, all of my in, all of my job experience has been in a professional environment, and I, I want to tell you that when people were neat and orderly and on time, that pretty much trumped everything. <laughs> it was, you know. So I mean, maybe some ladies. I don't. We won't get off into workplace stuff, but uh, I do kind of hear, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that if it could feel like you're oppressed at work and then you come and get oppressed at church. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, I can't give too much of an argument for that. I just gave you all of my experience with women in hair at work. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's from a distance. The only time I had a problem with a woman in her hair was when it wasn't done and she came to work you know all the rollers and all that was still in there and it was still wet that that was a problem mm -hmm. but uh, i really didn't pay much attention as long as it wasn't a distraction you know and i guess that too is in the eye of the beholder but anyway i'm gonna let some of these ladies who've been waiting come in sister d go ahead yeah um <clears throat> i just want to say that um over the years um, being in the in the church, I never really understood the concept of not. Um, well, I I was I was somewhat clear on jury because my grandmother made sure of that. But as I noticed, it just kind of left me with this feeling of. Well, then how am I supposed to look and feel about myself as a young lady coming up? Because in this day and age, the culture is changing. People are changing their hair. People are, you know, now we're going back towards natural hair and things like that. I like to keep my hair braided because it's convenient and uh, it works for me. My husband doesn't have a problem with it. And it's, it's just something that I like to do. And I don't think that that should be up for discussion or scrutiny. And on the other hand, it doesn't hinder me from my walk with God. And I don't like to, to talk, to pretty much go into these conversations because we don't, I was somebody who suffered from low self-esteem. I didn't feel good about myself as a young person coming up. And I didn't have that nurturing um, after I was told, you know, well, we don't do this, we don't do that. We don't wear this, we don't wear that. And I'm like, well, 
where in in the in the Bible do I'm supposed to have some comfort, you know, in feeling good about myself as a person? Everything is called a sin. And I don't believe it's a sin to feel good about yourself as a person. I don't right. believe that God put us here to 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 say, well, we don't because we don't wear this and we don't wear that. You can't feel good about yourself as a person. It's well, a natural thing for women to feel beautiful, you know, and be, you know, men are attracted to beauty, okay. you know, and so God created us to be beautiful. And I don't, okay. I think sometimes as a church, you put too much emphasis and it's harsh sometimes for people. It's harsh okay. um, because sometimes there's no follow up with, okay, what, 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 what's in the place of that? Okay. You know, we need some nurturing. All right. Well, well, uh, I got it. I got, I got your whole thing now. Well, let me just go step by step. Um, first of all, you're having an argument that nor me or the author is having. Uh, we can't make something say something it didn't say. I've, I've said it several times now about the pagan women coming from a, a Roman and Greek culture where braiding gold and silver into your hair was a part of their pagan worship. And so what the emphasis there was trying to break away from that and not be associated with pagan worship. That has nothing to do with black women braiding their hair. So that's not something the scripture is saying. And if somebody has been teaching that, then you've been listening to the wrong teacher. The teacher has to understand what they're talking about. Right. So uh, whether you're saying broided or braided, the issue was the ornaments in the hair and what it signified to people of that time. That is the issue. Now, saying that uh, the church doesn't want women to feel good about themselves is an extreme argument. It's, it's the same thing as saying, well, why y'all telling us not to get abortions? I mean, what if I was raped? Well, the percentage of people who are raped are very small. And of course, we're not talking to those people. So it's using an extreme to try to muddy the water to change the argument from what is being said, which is modesty. Uh, not once have I heard a Adventist uh, teacher who is ordained to say that women shouldn't feel good about themselves or should look good. Um, you know, I, I understand that girls coming up and boys coming up have this feeling that we can't do nothing. But that is, that is an argument from a child's point of view. When you mature and become an adult, you should look from an adult's point of view. Now you have some mileage behind you. Now you have some experience that teaches that there are some areas that if you go into them, you put yourself in danger. You, you, you uh, put yourself in harm's way. Uh, of course, a, a, a 14, 15 year old would not see it that way, but certainly a fully grown adult should understand that. So there's never a time where, where the church is saying you can't do anything, nor is there a time where we're not using the Bible. And if somebody is doing that, that is poor leadership. Somebody needs to mute, okay. That is poor leadership. Uh, so don't associate poor leadership who has an agenda with solid biblical doctrine, which, which is preventive in its approach. Uh, preventive always is a struggle for people developing as they grow up because they feel invincible. They feel like, hey, well, what about this? And then they're very over overly emotional instead of logical. Uh, and uh, e emotions uh, can be flighty, but logic will save your life. So uh, I want to let you respond to that, Sister D, if you you would like. Uh, if not, we'll go on. Yeah, I just think for, for women, it's quite different. Um, because our going into our womanhood is 85 to 95% based on what we experience as young women and teenagers. And it's not to say a man can't understand that, but I believe it's quite different for women. Um, 
because it starts in our childhood, our image of ourselves. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with braided hair. I'm not, I, you know, I'm just, I was just using that as an example because I like to get my hair braided. But over the years, and I'm, I'm just a very observant person. I just know some women in church, um, and I know them personally, so I'm, you know, I'm not speculating or whatever, but it's just, they have this dreariness, you know, sometimes about themselves and they've never really, you know, I don't know, dressed a certain way that showed that they were a happy person. I, it could be, you know, for whatever reason, but for some of them, most of it was the fact that they felt they couldn't wear makeup. They couldn't, you know, it's a personal thing. I get it. But um, I just think that when we tap into or touch certain areas in the church that are very sensitive, we need nurturing. We need, you know, we need some love and comforting behind it. Um, yeah. Because some people don't respond well to um, like somebody just take, making them feel like they take something from them and didn't give anything back, so to speak. Okay, uh, I I can appreciate that, and uh, and I my heart goes out to you because again, it sounds like you had poor leadership. You know, I grew up in an Adventist church, and. Um, you know, maybe I should ask some of my contemporaries who grew up in that church with me. There's a lot of girls, a lot of boys, and uh, they didn't seem depressed or dreary or or feel like somebody, maybe it was because it was a lot of us. I, I know a lot of things that we've enjoyed in my particular church is because it was so many young people. So whatever you go through, it's always better when you have somebody to go through it with you. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, that's my answer. Poor leadership. Sister Gladys, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want to say thank you for explaining, um, the, the jewelry in the hair, because I was just getting ready to go out and buy something to put in my hair. And when you said that, I said, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I, um, so I was glad that you explained that to me, but I wanted to tell you that in 1996, I started locking my hair. And I came to Southeast and, you know, it didn't, it wasn't a pretty sight when you first start locking your hair. And these three ladies came up to me and said, I know you're not coming in our church with your hair looking like that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I, I was shocked. And I said, now these three ladies, they were elderly sisters and mm. um, they were of, of age where, you know, you want to give them their respect. So I, I didn't get angry, but I just looked at them and they said to me, now, can we touch it? And so I knew then that they weren't serious when they asked that. But I said, I bowed my head. I said, yes. I don't like nobody touching my hair, but I said, yes, you can touch it. And then they started asking me questions about it. But I wanted to say it didn't disturb me because my journey on being having my hair locked was a spiritual one. And when the Most High said, Gladys, I want you to come out that perm and cut off your hair and lock it, I had to be obedient. And I find that the more I seek the most high, the more his light is poured into me. And the more that light shines in me, it becomes me. And that light is attracted to other people's lights. So I worry about the beauty within me and, and let the most high deal with the outward adorning. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And every time a lady says something about somebody saying something crazy, it just really... Uh, burns me up because it is not Christian. There's nothing Christian about that, about going up to somebody, insulting them, whether they try to make it out of a joke or whatever. It's, it's, it's not funny. All right, uh, Dr. Pan. <clears throat> I'm just going to say, yeah, every time I'm on here, I do listen to you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I take it to heart. I might have questions, but uh, I have listened. I didn't have to make a lot of changes because I really wasn't wearing much jewelry. Uh, I had some gold things I was going to put in my hair, some silver too, but I guess I won't do that. And I didn't <laughs> wear a lot of makeup. But just to let you know, yes, I listen. I may ask questions, but I do listen and take to heart what you're trying to teach us. All right. Well, thank you, Elder. I appreciate that. Um, it's a conversation. Um, and it can be a very good conversation or it could be a very bad conversation. 
and um, some things that are coming up after this. I, I, I like the, I, I picked this picture. There's a lot of them to choose from because this young lady on your screen is confident. Um, I think on one or two of these pictures, she has some little studs in her ear, but it's not the first thing you see. The first thing I see on this young lady is her smile. What do y'all think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I, I, I just tried to find something that kind of said what Paul and Peter were saying uh, in a visual format. You know, she's uh, she doesn't have a potato sack on but neither is she trying to be very sensual or anything, but she's still very feminine. I, I wouldn't let my daughter uh, leave the house like this. Okay. Uh, I mean, I know who, would, who would, would or wouldn't, but I would let my daughter leave the house like this because um, she is leading to, in my opinion, with her personality. Okay. All right, Elder Stone, come save me. <laughs> okay. Uh, page 59, chapter 5. <laughs> uh, to what degree should she compromise the truth of God in little things to keep things smooth at home and possibly to help win her husband? Peter's advice is simple and clear cut. Don't compromise truth and principle at all. Even if the wife is not permitted to speak about her faith, she can win her husband by her chaste conversation. Other translations use the more proper term conduct instead of conversation. Right. But notice how the conduct of the Christian wife will manifest itself. Peter asserts that she will win her husband much more readily by laying aside the outward adornment. Surely the spirit of God anticipated the dilemma of the wife who feels that she needs to wear a wedding ring to please her husband, even though she knows it does not please the Lord. Wow. This text makes it exceedingly clear that God should come first and that such a decision also will do more to win the husband than any other course. Hundreds of evangelists and pastors could bear witness that this is true. The women who eventually lead their husbands into the faith are the ones who hold firmly to the standard of God's word. The ones who do not win their companions are those who will let down the standard in little things to be more compatible with their unbelieving husbands. Mm. This may seem contradictory, and it does, but the <laughs> practical results are de demonstrable. As long as the wife is not living up to all the points of her own belief, the husband figures that it must not be very important. He cannot get excited about doing something which does not even claim the full compliance of his sweet Christian wife. But if she does take a firm stand to please the Lord above all others, even in the face of his own displeasure, the husband is deeply impressed that this religious bit must be important. He probably will say nothing about his true feelings. He may in fact affect great indignation, but his respect and admiration will be secretly stirred by the firm, conscientious stand of his wife. Hmm. All right. I have a little quick little story to tell. Uh, all while I was growing up, my father, my mother was at Venice, and my father was free will Baptist. And I finally got the courage at about 17 to ask him, what in the world is a free will Baptist? Because I'll never see you go to church unless somebody die. <laughs> and, he, and he told me, that a free will Baptist is I do whatever the blankety blankety blank I want to do, <laughs> right? And, you, and during that time, my mother 
uh, was very stern about her, uh, her, her Christian beliefs. The only thing that ever discouraged my father was people coming over for dinner after church and talking about people and things that happen in church that discouraged him. Uh, but uh, if you fast forward to today, uh, guess who is rushing my mother uh, for worship and guess who can't wait to get to go do the food pantry and whatever else, whatever ministries that the church does. My father, he's telling her to cheer up and stay faithful. And this is because she patiently waited for, um, I would say, uh, at least 25, 30 years that I can think of while, um, while he kept doing what he was doing and one thing left at a time, smoking was first, then drinking, then uh, having the TV on whatever he wanted to on the Sabbath is one thing after another. Then it came the pork and this, uh, just she patiently loved her husband through all of that. And I do recall one of the issues was the wedding ring, uh, but he loved her more than he loved the ring. Hallelujah. He loved her more than that. <laughs> and they uh, they were together as far as I can remember, and they're still together today. No teeth and all. They all they still together. <laughs> and, uh, and and I watch my mother witness in silence. So I'm not saying that it's gonna work for everybody. I just know that it worked for her. You want to say something, Elder Stone? Oh, 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 Brother Mike, go ahead. You know, where it talked about um, putting God first. Mm -hmm. Me and my wife, when we, we first got married, before we got married, we made that rule between both of us that God comes first. Yeah. She comes second. Same with me. I come second. Mm. But that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, God yeah. comes first. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm not sure which is two iPhones, so I'm not sure which one it is, but go ahead. <laughs> that's me, Pastor. Yeah, right. I, I want to give my little testimony also of putting God first. You know, my husband is not, um, he doesn't go to church and stuff like that, but this was a, always a battle between us. He's always telling me I give the church too much tithe. And, you know, I don't have to give the church my tithe. I can go help people out there with it. And he has his own belief. And, you know, over the years, I stand firm. I'm like, no, you know, the tithe belonged to God and my offerings and stuff like that. So it was a battle for a while. But, you know, um, it happens until he doesn't even bother me about it anymore. And um, he doesn't really say anything because I know, you understand what my beliefs are. And I know, you know, I want to honor God in the, and be obedient to him. There is another battle that um, I had with him when Sabbath comes come around. You know, he will normally put the TV on and watch anything but at Sabbath time, at sunset, I watch my Sabbath programs on TV. And it was a battle for a while that he would put his stuff on, but little by little, you know, I see him start, you know, put watching the Sabbath program and he start tuning into it and stuff like that. And even when I'm on the prayer line and stuff like that, things that he used to, you know, kind of, you know, talk to me about, he kind of mellowed out about it. So I have to stand my grounds and, um, you know, in love, in love and patience with him and, um, Things have been turned around because I stand up for what I believe. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, I recognize some of those things in your in your struggle. You ladies, I mean, you know, nobody messes with you more than me, but nobody respects you more than me. That's why I told you about my mother. You know, I, I watch her with the different pots growing up. My father wanted his pork. She didn't stop him. And I don't know how she could make it taste good without tasting it, but she did. <laughs> and he ate it 
until it became a thing of he really took her witness serious. And uh, I think one of the most important parts about it is he didn't create a dilemma over the three boys, which I'm the oldest. He didn't create a dilemma of he wanted them to do one thing and she wanted them to do another thing. And I think that was probably the biggest contribution that uh, my father made to our growth. Uh, Brother Parker, go ahead. I'm gonna testify about um, my wife also. Now, mm. when she began to stop eating meat, she asked me to stop eating meat. And I told her, I said, no, <laughs> I don't see nothing wrong with chicken, turkey. I'm laughing because me and Sister you Hood know, had the same yeah. conversation. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I told Sister I said, Hood, if he come anywhere near me, I'm going to bite him on the ankle, on the back, on the butt, wherever I can get him, I'm going to eat him. <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Parker. <laughs> I, I did stop eating pork, you know, because I knew that was bad. But I say, ain't nothing wrong with chicken, ain't nothing wrong with fish, ain't nothing wrong with turkey. And so I kept eating it. I did that for about six months. But she stuck to her gun. She, she didn't eat none. She didn't stop me, but she didn't eat none. So slowly but surely, I began. I stopped eating the fish. Because there's one thing that I really, you know, a certain type of fish, I just like some I don't. That wasn't hard at all. And I stopped eating chicken. Then I stopped eating turkey. But the thing mm. is, she held her ground. Now, just think if she had not held her ground, I would still be eating those foods. And she never fussed at me. She might she might say, you know, it's not good for you. I say, yeah, I say, it's all right. It's clean, you know, and something like that. But that's about it. And she would not nag me about doing it at all. She just said, I'm not going to do it no matter what. I said, okay. And so I stopped. But when he says that the wife, is the one who helps the husband become sanctified or help to come into the church. It is true because women are more susceptible to the spirit of God than some men. When I say that, I mean that we are stubborn where a woman is, well, not all women, but some women are not. But that's the, the key thing to winning a husband is a wife who stands her ground on what the Lord, on what thus says the Lord. That's right. That's right. I, I agree 100%. And, um, and I, I appreciate y'all coming back again and again, week after week, <laughs> no matter where this conversation is going. Uh, let Sister Aretha come in. Then I'm going to ask y'all what y'all think about the sister on the screen. Go ahead, Sister Aretha. I just wanted to add something. Um, my household was a little different. My mother nor my father went to church, but my mother made all eight of us kids go to church every Sunday, mm. which I thought was kind of odd because my mother nor my father went and they, and she was sent all eight of us every Sunday. And as a child, I used to be angry about it because I felt like, why do we have to go and y'all not going? Right. It did. It, it used to make me angry, but Today, as a grown woman, I am more grateful than I could even begin to express because she gave me the greatest inheritance I could have ever received, and that's knowing Christ. Hmm. Amen. Well, that was a common thing in the hood. You know, uh, we, we would start with vacation Bible school, and then uh, every Sabbath, you know, there'd be, be kids being sent to church and that neither of their parents would come. And so I appreciate you bringing, appreciate that, up you bringing that up. All right, so tell me now, uh, let me see what time it is. Okay, we still got a few more minutes. Tell me now about this sister on the screen. What, what is your impression of how she, uh, her presentation? I, I really wanna hear what the ladies have to say. I think I like the dress. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Elder Pam. I said she is beautiful. She is modest. Yes, she is. Go ahead, uh, Elder Stone, then Sister Aretha. Um, 
I like her dress. I like the blue. Um, it just depends on what is the occasion. You know, what uh, she does have on jewelry, but mm -hmm. it depends. Is that a wedding outfit? Is she going to a wedding? I have seen many people uh, who normally don't wear jewelry, but at weddings, they wear jewelry. Uh -huh. I've seen that too. All right, Sister Aretha, go ahead. Um, I like it because it's long and it doesn't really show her legs. I like it because it's modest at the same time, but it's slightly flashy because of the shimmering kind of a look that it has to it. But outside of that, I think she looks wonderful. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Robinson. Um, actually, yeah, the color is a pretty color. But one of the reasons I tuned in because I've been listening to you folk and, and the comments have just been um, wonderful in the sense that people are speaking their minds. Yes. And, yes. And, I, and I feel that this is equivalent to God saying, come let us reason together. Yes. And these sessions, I, none of us should get angry or, or whatever. We're just simply expressing what we think, what we seriously feel about certain things. And one of my issues, um, I tuned in earlier when you, when you were talking about color and whatnot. Even though this color is beautiful, I personally would choose a multicolor something because color is my thing. Oh, okay. I love more color. And I cannot believe that God uh, displayed in, in the um, animal world, um, flowers, trees, birds, whatever, as beautiful as they are, I don't see why man has to be drab. I'm not saying this woman is drab, that, that's a beautiful color. I'm mm -hmm. saying, if we choose to wear certain colors, and certainly I would include in that red, purple, or whatever, because right. I'm not a Je I'm not a Jezebel. I'm not <laughs> trying, you know, and I'm not trying to vamp anybody. I just simply love color. It's in my home. It's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and so I think we need to um, consider that when we make statements about people that somehow if you love the Lord you, you have to have something on that's long and you have to be a little drab uh, because that shows your sincerity I don't believe that uh, well that's not quite what I said but I have heard some comments like that in the previous lessons not in this particular chapter but right. I think the one on dresses and stuff like that it kind of went that way is that sister Veronica Yes, Pastor. Now, is she dressed up going to church or what? Um, uh, I didn't want to give any context. I just okay, want to well, right. so of her. I'm going to say I love the dress. I love the shininess because she's shining for Jesus. So mm -hmm. I love it. In fact, I'm going to look for a dress like that so I can wear it to church <laughs> because it has the right length. The shoes is right. But the makeup, the jewelry that she has on. So, you know, um, Sister Elderstone said, maybe, you know, some people do it when they're going to a wedding if they don't do it at church. But I believe if you don't do it at church, you shouldn't even do it at wedding, you know, because God is our honest 24 seven. So mm -hmm. um, the dress is nice, but the, the makeup and the jewelry, she has a beautiful smile though. Yeah, she has a beautiful smile, but I would say the makeup and the jewelry have to go. All right. All right. Thank you, Sister Veronica. Sister D. Um, so it, it, to me, it looks like the, someone said earlier, it depends on the occasion. Mm -hmm. um, I would say maybe she was, if, if I saw this on someone, I would say maybe going to a wedding or reception or something like that. It's not my style. Um, I don't like the color. <laughs> it's, just, it's, not, it's not something I would buy. But if this was a, a wedding, you know, a reception or 
something of that nature. I would say that's nice. Oh, that's mm-hmm. nice, but it's not for Sister Mills. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you so much, Sister Gladys. Hi, um, I would say this lady is casket sharp, as Medea would say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my mom always told me never judge a book by its cover. And so, you know, she's pleasing to the eyes, but, you know, I, she's saying, look, I'm reachable. You can come and reach me. You can come and talk to me. But to, 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 to put a judgment on it, I'd rather not. Um, well, I'd like it's to only on style, not on her, per, nothing about her personality, anything like oh, that. Oh, well, the style is nice. I mean, I can, mm-hmm. I, I like it. It doesn't offend me and it mm-hmm. doesn't, um, even the makeup and jewelry doesn't bother me. Um, I see, I see the women on three ABN with more makeup than that on. So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, um, that that's my was raised. maybe I'll talk about that at some point, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not trying to cut that, you off. No, that's it. That's it. It doesn't, like okay. I said, she's casket sharp. Okay. All right. I don't see any other hands. So let me give you uh, my take on it. Um, when it comes to modesty, when it comes to modesty, um, you know that dress attitude is a form of communication. And the question that I have to ask myself is this lady trying to communicate something sensual? Okay. And uh, the answer is no. I don't think she's trying to communicate anything sensual. Um, She is not accentuating any particular body parts or anything like that. Um, You know, uh, sisterhood would not wear the necklace. Uh, I don't think other than her lipstick, oh, wait a minute, I do see some color in her eye, but I don't think anything in her makeup is overstated. Uh, you know, maybe the lipstick might be a little bold, uh, you know, but um, that's, you know, that's the problem with all of this, isn't it? Is that we have opinions <laughs> and we're trying to find So that's why I put this picture up because it wasn't a perfect picture. I could have put one up where a lady had no jewelry on or look at her wrist, look at her hands, or she could have been overdone. And I don't think she is either, right? So, um, uh, yes, yes, come on in. You know, I was just gonna say, um, I think this lady looks beautiful. She's Mm -hmm. a tall lady. The dress fits her very well. I think she looks very modest. She does have a little light makeup on, but it's not a lot. She doesn't, I think it looks pretty. I think it's modest. And like someone said, the women on 3ABN, I think they use, (laughs) to me, they are modest as this woman is. And she looks nice. And like I heard somebody say earlier, you don't have to wear drab, ugly clothes to look like a Christian. And I just think God wants women to look attractive. And most men like their wives to look attractive. Okay. All right. All right. Elder uh, Pam, go ahead. So my direct question is, (laughs) Mm -hmm. so some makeup is okay as long as it's not colorful makeup? Is that what we're saying here? Um, well, yeah, well, you know, um, when it comes to, to ladies and their skin and all of that, I don't get involved in that. Uh, the only time that I will say something is if it's overdone, trying to get attention, uh, being, um, being, uh, sensual, that kind of thing. And, and just me saying that. You know, I can say to a lady, you're trying, you're trying to get, you're trying to be a distraction. And she would say, no, I'm not, you see. <laughs> so, so, but I think that on a, just a basic level, without going too deep on a basic level, um, we can tell both men and women uh, who is just trying to smooth out their face and, and cover up some blemishes and look nice and who is going over the top. And um, 
uh, that's as far as I want to go with it because okay, uh, so I can put my foundation there. back on, right? <laughs> well, that's between you and Mr. Elderman. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I wouldn't call it a sin if you put a little foundation on your face uh, because D does make a, I'm sorry, Sister Mills, she does make a very powerful point about how a woman feels about herself. And especially I had some friends growing up who had uh, legitimate skin problems. You know, when talk about growing up in the Adventist church about teenage girls and such forth, so forth, had legitimate, you know, had to have a dermatologist with medicated this, that, and the other. Um, we are, um, I come from the Adventist Mecca of where I come from, good strict of all strictness, but they did not bother a young lady about that, especially those who had, we had, uh, I don't know what you call it. We had a young lady who had part of her skin was light, part of it was dark. You know, it's like speckled like that all over her body. Vitiligo. Uh, Vitiligo. Vitiligo, yes. Um, we had, I come from the E.E. E. Cleveland, whatever, Institute of Strictness, and they did not bother her about smoothing that out. Uh, and that's why I said to Dee earlier, um, it sounds like some of our churches is just given poor leadership. It's, it's a principle that you're trying to teach. And uh, the principle can be lost in the ugliness of just being vicious for no reason. Um, my brother, my middle brother had skin problems in his teenage years where he had all kind of stuff, spots and, and people teased him about that. And that's not a female. And uh, that really hurt him. You know, he wasn't gonna put no makeup on, but I mean, I understand that um, that that there's a certain level of, of confidence that you need to have in yourself when you walk out uh, of the house. Um, this is not what our conversation has been about. I don't know how strongly I can say this. Remember, I'm the one adding these pictures. There's no pictures in the book. I put pictures up to create conversation. Um, this woman remind me of Vicki Wine. I'm a Vicki Wine fan, right? She remind me of her. I don't know who this woman is. It's just a picture, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I don't know if I'm sound, I sound like I'm splitting hairs, but I'll stick to my guns on the first thing I said. We all know the difference between someone who is extra and someone who is modest and godly. We know the difference. Uh, Sister Robinson, go ahead. Pastor, I am so glad that you made those statements because um, in listening and, and, and some, some, some of the statements that can be made or inferred that we shouldn't touch anything, whatever we came into this world looking like and we grew up, that, that's, that's what we need to be. Mm. But, you know, you have to, to, to reason, as you say, some people have certain blemishes they have this or that, Birth and there's nothing. <laughs> yeah, and there's nothing wrong with making corrections. I mean, certainly, if a child' uh, mouth is messed up, then then the surgeons are going to fix that, you know, mm -hmm. so that they can go through life feeling good about themselves. And uh, and and I I just I just believe that we can go off the deep end about certain things. Mm -hmm. And the comment that I wanted to make about if you will allow me, the um, sure. wedding rings, because I, I thought that was an excellent discussion on both sides, for and against. But we have to realize that it's only when the Holy Spirit impresses a person. You can know something factually, mm -hmm. and you can even read it in the Bible, because the Bible clearly says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But it is not until the Holy Spirit convicts on things that a person is changed. And, uh, and whoever is wearing rings or whatever, it's not like on, on a certain Sabbath where all, everybody's going to march down and take off their rings. <laughs> um, it's, 
let the Holy Spirit move. And I'm saying that because I wore jewelry. I loved jewelry. Mm -hmm. And it was not until I decided to research scripture for myself, what does God say about it? And it was not until, even though I read what, what was written, it was not until the Holy Spirit convicted me that I took it off because I was adamant that I was not going to do it just because somebody told me to. Um, and so I just have confidence that if this is, as scripture says, if it offends God, God says his sheep hear his voice and at, at a certain point, then the person will take it off. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's just my feeling. Yeah, I think it's very, very wise counsel, Sister Robinson. If you, if you pay attention to me, um, if, if you will never see me get really frustrated until someone dismisses scripture, when, when scripture is set aside for our feelings, that is the gateway to all sin, no matter what we're talking about. Right. Um, you know, so that is where we, 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 will, we will bump heads to no end. Now we bump heads over other things, but it's just my opinion against yours and mine is no more important than yours. Uh, when it comes to the word of God, it, it really comes down to where I am when I encounter that word. You know, we have to be in a submissive place uh, uh, to an open place when we encounter the word of God, because I, I've been preaching this stuff since I was 16. And much of it, I didn't understand at that time, I'm now beginning to understand a lot of things that I had just kind of looked at it, I saw it, but I didn't see it. So I think your, your counsel is, uh, is really, really wise on on this, it really is between that individual uh, and God when, you know, based on how they see it. But, um, but anyway, I'm gonna I'm leave that where it is. Uh, Elder Pam, go ahead. So, you know, what about how people may interpret scripture different? And I'm not going to talk about makeup, but I'm going to talk about women's ordination when we had that big to do. Some yeah. people said that the Bible says women should be ordinated. Some people says no. But I mean, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, the Holy Spirit convicts you, but they felt convicted that women should not be ordinated. And other people felt convicted that they should be. How do you rectify that? Uh, the way that we did, uh, we, we come to the table with our research and our prayer. And when we disagree and we're gridlocked, we vote. Because that's the mechanism God gave us is to vote. When it doesn't mean that the person that's for or against is more holy than either or the other. It just means that we have come to different conclusions. Now, in that particular issue of women's ordination, um, it was kind of like, and I know this is going to sound crazy, it's kind of like on the view of women in pants, <laughs> right? Uh, when, when, it, when the scripture was written about wearing men's dress, there was no seamstress or equipment that could make pants in a universal way that would let women be modest. And so in order to stay there, you got to put blinders on <laughs> and say that it is not possible for women to wear pants in a decent way. That's for women and not male pants. And, um, and I'm sure the church still struggles with that to this day but it does not mean that's what that scripture was saying. Uh, for instance, I'll answer the question about women's ordination. The original intent was for there to be symmetry between the household and the church. The man is the head of the house and the man is the head of the uh, church, not because he's smarter, but, but because he's built, his body is built to defend it physically. 
to carry it physically, to provide for it physically. Uh, it's like asking a man, like a man saying, I want to now carry the, the child in the womb for nine months. Well, you don't have a womb. You're not built to carry a womb. Um, that is the original intent. However, we also see places in scripture where there were not faithful men, but there were faithful women. And God said, okay, well, let's go. You see, so then we have to look at the time that we live in. Do we have uh, faithful men answering the call to the extent where we don't need women to lead in that way? And the answer is no, we do not. That makes sense, uh, Elder Pam? Yes. Um, <laughs> and you mentioned the voting, but even though uh, we voted, people are still in different camps. And the majority won, that's because yeah. of all those African countries. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but time will uh, resolve it. Uh, many ways that pastors and leaders get in trouble is that they think they have to do something about everything right now. No, you don't. <laughs> you know, if you believe that God, you know what God said about something and you know that it's right, then eventually God will fix it. All right? So, so at this present moment in the time we live in, we need some Debras <laughs> because, because some Samson's out there in them streets and they ain't where he's supposed to be. So we need Debras to help the brothers who are faithful. And at the, at the time where the Samson's come out them streets, then the true Deborahs don't mind falling back and allowing those Samson's to lead. Uh, it's really that simple. It's the one thing we don't wanna say is in many ways, our church sometimes is in error. And when we're in error, we take the faithful who are available and willing. Availability is your best ability. I know you all heard that. All right, y'all done took me off track. Sister D, go ahead. We got to come back to this and maybe okay. we'll pick it up next week. <laughs> okay, I just want to say that um, mm -hmm. it's, it's so, so many different views on this topic. Um, and some of us that may feel certain kind of, you know, ways or whatever mm -hmm. about makeup and jewelry. Mm -hmm. I still say it's a personal thing because some of it is cultural um for example in some cultures in um i think in the islands uh, we had a pastor from barbados and when they go home they have to wear their wedding band because otherwise in their culture if they didn't come back home with it then the thought would be that they were in trouble they were divorcing or they were divorced and so they purchased rings, but they didn't wear them in, in church uh, when I was a kid. But they mm -hmm. said when they go home, they have to put them, put, they put them on. So it's, 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 it's a personal and maybe culture is what I'm sticking to. However. Well, the Bible is the same in every culture, right? I understand. And I'm not discounting that, but I, he just made it clear, like when they go home, in their culture, what happens and it's, it's different, even though the Bible is the same and Adventism around the world, the message is the same. It's not treated the same, you know, and. Well, let me ask you a question and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. If you had to choose living obedient to God, unmarried versus living in sin married, what would you choose? Can you repeat that? If you had to choose between living obedient to God alone okay. versus living in sin married, what would you choose? You're breaking up. Could you I'm repeat that? Up. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. If you had to choose between living in sin married versus living obedient to God alone, what would you choose? Is this for anybody? Oh, well, I was asking D. <laughs> oh, well, I'm still here. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I would rather be obedient to God. 
Yeah, we'll I see. I wouldn't be comfortable living openly and blatantly sinning and expecting God to be pleased with that. Well, I wouldn't. We'll see, but the, the Holy Spirit. The Go dilemma ahead. that you propose, and it's not a new one, the dilemma that you propose uh, presents it as if you don't have a choice. I have to because my husband would whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, it's leaving out the other side. Choose a husband that loves the Lord. But my thing is this, I was... I was using that as an example. No, no, I was using it as an example. We had a pastor, and you, you, you probably know who he is, or he's he's gone now. No, no names, no blame. Don't, no, no they're not here anymore. But my, my point was he because when this when this came up in the church, this was what they explained to us when they go home to their country what they had what they had to do. See, and had to is my culturally issue. Culturally, is you know, where's the dividing line? If it's well, biblical, you, according to the Word of God, the, the Bible is the deciding factor. Is right. that says the Lord? But when they went home to their family in another country, they didn't. You know, he didn't say that they took the stand with what God said, and we're not going to do it. He said they put their rings on, but they didn't wear them in the U.S. So then that makes it okay for everybody. No, I'm not seeing that. <laughs> okay, but then what's the point? Because we don't live in that situation. So I'm trying to get there, to get there with you. Uh, so if it's, it's back to the thing about, well, we cannot, we cannot ban abortions because some women get sexually assaulted. <clears throat> right? So now we need to leave that alone. Well, that's not in real, when real data, that's not what the statistics say at all. You know, so, you know, I, I used vitiligo earlier. I, I use that as an example, but I wasn't trying to apply that to everybody. I'm just trying to say, I understand, you know, so, so anyway, y'all, I, I let this go on too long. I'm gonna have to go on and wrap it up, but I do like the conversation. Go but ahead. That's just, just what I'm saying. Didn't you say that the reason why they made the compromise about the wedding rings was because of some cultures? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I did say that oh. because that's what happened. And here's the thing about the beautiful thing about our church is though we may not all agree, once we vote is over with. And, and it, so that all that really means is that I'm not coming for somebody wearing a wedding ring, but that's not going to make me put one on. You know, I still have to be honest about my own personal situation. So, so that's, that's the system God gave us. And uh, that's what we're going to use. Uh, so is that Sister Veronica again? Yes, Pastor. I'm just going to quickly say this. I came from a culture, I always tell you guys, I came from a culture that was decked out in jewelry because Hindu, they were jewelry on their toe, nose, everywhere. And when I came to the Lord, you know, um, when I baptized in the Adventist church, you know, that was one of the things they told us that we can't wear anymore. And I gave it up. But I just want to say, it's a personal thing between you and God, how much you want, you know? Oh, how, how, how much you want, you know, of God, you know? How much is your relationship is with him? You understand Amen. me? It's a personal thing. Um, and it, it varies for everybody. It, it, it varies for everybody. It's, the, the, um, you know, as I said, it, it depends on your relationship with God. I was willing to give it up because I wanted that relationship with him. And I never missed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Okay. You know, the, the bottom line for me is like I, I shared before, regardless to what the conference says, the, the, the Northern American division, you know, the bottom line is what is God saying? What does the word of God says? And the reason why it's so important to me, because we have to be careful with that because the Bible says that he's going to hold us accountable for other people going astray. And so when, when, when we're giving 
you know, information, it, it has to be for me, a thus saith the Lord, because we all have opinions, we all have ideas, and they're going to differ from time to time. And, you know, and I hear you when you say you take a vote and all that, and that's fine and good. But at the end of it all, if it. We can't hear you. Did you mute yourself? The word of God. Then oh, you go. I personally would not be comfortable. Hmm? Yeah. Ahead, I, you know, because, you know, I'm thinking. Oh, you didn't hear me. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I would I would be I would concern myself with you know uh my brother you know because you're you're if 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 i'm holding on to what you say um versus what thus said the lord well well we lost you again i hear you in the house but they the voted hear. they said for me i cannot huh you you we lost can a you all hear me of that. we hear you now yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Even if Pastor Hood was a president and he says that, OK, we took a vote and you can do X, Y, Z. And at the end of that, I still want to know what what thus saith the Lord and Pastor Hood will be held just as responsible and accountable to those who in turn says, well, you know, yeah, we work out our own salvation, but it can be kind of muddy the water when you know, we're, we're men and women of God, quote unquote, when men and women of God yeah, who's well. hearing from heaven and everybody, I think someone said that everybody is hearing from heaven, but we got all these different messages. And in my mind, wait a minute, that can't be true because God never contradicts himself. So some of this is not God, this is man. And so for me, yeah. I want to see what the word has to say. But we have to be fully confident that whatever God wants to communicate to us is going to be clear for those who seek God. We have to seek him and work out our own salvation. And uh, I think the, the question or the dilemma that Elder Pam proposes was excellent. It, it is something that's fairly fresh. We all remember when various pastors around our denomination had different takes on women's ordination. And the, the thing that made everybody scratch their head is because we had respect for all of them. So <laughs> here's people we respect that differ in how they're interpreting the scripture. And our system is at that point, when uh, we come to that impasse, we vote. And that does not force anyone to wear something or do something. That, that they are not convicted of, but it says to, it acknowledges those who feel convicted to do it, but we're not clear uh, and, and, and our leadership on it. Um, it, it. It may not be perfect, but that's what we have. Can I make a comment? Sure. Okay, I just wanted to say, cause I'm thinking maybe some of the newer members don't know when there was a general conference session. And my understanding when a general conference is in session and they're voting on something like women's ordination or whether they can preach, that it's to be listened to because they pray and when they ask God to, and when they vote on it. And I remember when Adventist women did not wear pants. But there came a time when they met and they decided there's such thing as women's pants and men's pants, and they are made different, you know. Yes, and yes. the wedding band, I mean, the Bible don't say that a woman has to wear a dress all the time. And in, in Bible times, men wore these long robes down, to, you know, the Lord said, come let's reason together. And the wedding band was not jewelry, but the wedding band was something that the Seventh Day Adventists voted on at their uh, meetings that they have every five years, like the one that they're going to have next year. And they mm -hmm. vote on certain things. They voted, voted that the plain wedding band, and they, they at another one, they voted that there's a such thing as women's pants okay mm -hmm. 
So you agree with me that that's what that's our system, and we should abide with it when we come to come to an account. It's kind of like Matthew eighteen, right? Uh, when we are when we disagree, we try to work it out between each other. If that doesn't work. We bring somebody else. If that don't work, we take it to the church. Is that what right. you're saying, Sister Whitlock? Yes, I am. You bring okay. it to the church. And these <laughs> things, all three of those you mentioned, did go to the church, to the world church. Yes. And these were, and I was wondering if maybe some of the newest, newer members didn't realize this. It's just like if something is voted on in Congress, they take it to the Supreme Court, and what the Supreme Court said is the law of the land. And what mm -hmm. the general conference said is the law of the Seventh-day Adventist church is not just people in our church, the people from Africa and India and Korea, all over the world, they vote on these things. And whatever they vote on, um, but and, and with both of them, they gave conditions. With the wedding band, it was just the plain wedding band. It didn't include the earrings, the necklace to match, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And with pants, the 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 you supposed to wear <coughs> with a tunic that came down below your hip. In other right. words, you're modest. Right, right. Well, look, we're gonna have to cut it off here. I, I really don't want to, but I have another appointment I got to get to. Uh, but I really have. I think that we turned a corner tonight, and uh, and I appreciate all of you. I want to leave you with this one last thing, though, just to be clear about it, that God knows the heart. You know, God knows whether we're truly, sincerely seeking something, uh, seeking the truth, or whether we're just seeking an excuse. So no matter what happens between us and another person, we have to remember that our Heavenly Father seeks and searches that heart, and he knows whether or not uh, we are, uh, are are sincerely serving him, or we're just trying to find ways to hold on to this world. But uh, but that is for another time. We got one one more on this particular chapter. Then we're going to move on, and hopefully we can actually move on to the next chapter and not keep talking about this one. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We're going to finish this up on next week. I thank you all for, uh, for being willing, having the courage to step out there and give your opinion and uh, have a wonderful holiday. We look forward to seeing you on Friday afternoon, whether you're with us or on Zoom. And of course, you'll be home in time to do Sabbath school, 730 for the kids and eight o'clock for the adults. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for how you are working uh, in our family, how we just keep coming back to the table because we want to be pleasing in your sight and we want to get along with one another. We appreciate how this conversation has blessed us and will bless those who will listen to it and watch it between now and next Wednesday. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.